to say that Matthias is one of the, um, the drive, he is the driving force for Einstein, I think, right now. Um, Einstein is a Newton emulator that lets you run Newton, uh, the Newton operating system on modern computers. And um, Matthias is really, uh, he's uh, a modest genius and he's a force. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he's got for us. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, right. And thanks, thanks for the additional half hour. I, I don't know how to fill that, but uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll just get going. And uh, just a little bit about me. I'm uh, German. Uh, I uh, grew up in Germany. I lived in Los Angeles for 10 years and worked for the film industry. I wrote software for uh, Sinking the Titanic, special effects software, uh, all the way to iRobot. That was the last movie I worked on. And uh, during that time in Los Angeles, um, yeah, I discovered the Newton, and uh, I think it was a 120, and I had to get it uh, as a uh, notorious early adopter. And uh, uh, I loved it, and it was fun, but as a software engineer, I was very frustrated because I couldn't write any software for it. And uh, so it went into the expensive toy box pretty quickly and was never looked at again until in probably 2006 or so I moved back to Germany or was in Germany back for a while and uh, the Newton actually made it the message pad made it through uh, four moves or something and fell out of some box and reminded me that I had it and that was um, pretty much the same time where Paul Guyot published uh, Einstein and um, uh, so I got very interested again and thought, oh, let's give it another chance and take a look at it uh, out of nostalgia. And um, yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty exciting. And um, what got me really into Einstein was it's, it's a great piece of software. It's written very cleanly and uh, it's uh, emulating a system that's also written very cleanly in a very interesting way. And um, uh, uh, for me, when I left the U.S., I never worked in programming anymore. So for me, this is the, the, the hobby, uh, the remaining hobby of uh, what I love to do. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to explain quickly, uh, Einstein is great because it just takes the unmodified ROM from either the message pad uh, 2100, 2000 in U.S. version or in the German version. Uh, or it takes the emate ROM. So all three ROMs are supported. You don't have to change anything. And the emulator kind of puts a, a dough around the ROM and makes the ROM feel like it, like right at home. So you can run the original Newton in every respect. Um, the, to just get this out of the way first, um, let me see if I get the screen sharing going here. Um, I don't know if you can see that. I uh, set up a page uh, under messagepad.org, O-R-G, um, because the whole electric trick was just a German word of joke. So um, to make it easier for you, messagepad.org. And here I have a downloads page. And on the download, downloads page, I have Einstein for Mac OS. You can download the application right away. It doesn't need to be installed. You just open it, uh, add the ROM to it, and it should work. Uh, the same for Windows. It's uh, just an executable. You just start it. You don't have to install it. And you need, do need the ROM, of course, uh, link to it, and it should just work. And the same for Linux. Um, there is a little bit of a description. Some of the systems uh, are very uh, keen on making sure that I don't write or read anything on your computer. And so they want to make sure that you absolutely agree that the software opens. But this is all explained when you click on the links um, up here, Mac OS, Windows, Linux. It's explained how exactly to step-by-step -step install the software. Um, the uh, there's going to be an Android version. I got it running today again, and it works nice. Uh, I'm pretty sure I will have it at a point uh, where it's really usable, and any Einstein, uh, any Android uh, PDA 
will work just like a message pad. And for me, uh, my I, uh, he can't see me. I have to unshare the screen. Does that work? I don't know. It's tough to do two things at the same time. No, it doesn't work. Take your time. There's usually a, yeah, there, there you go. Ah. Okay, so uh, I have the, the um, Samsung Note 10 and uh, Einstein runs really fast on it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it feels, you feel very at home. It's actually faster than the original, even though everything's emulated. All right, so now you know how to install the software, um, but that wouldn't fill an hour. So um, let me tell you a little bit about the story, how I met Paul and uh, how I, uh, or how I met Einstein first, not him personally, unfortunately. So I, I downloaded the software back then. It was a, a Mac OS only uh, program and it was not open source. It was uh, just there and I had to find the ROM downloaded it and plugged it in and it worked. It was just great. And I got very quickly frustrated because, um, well, we're talking about the time before iPads, just so you remember. Uh, a friend of mine gave me a Windows 2000 machine that actually was a slate and had a pen input. And I wanted to run Einstein on it so much, but it was a Mac OS software, so it wouldn't run. And a year later, uh, so yeah, out of frustration, kind of, uh, I couldn't get uh, the software development system to run and I couldn't get anything to run. So I started using Nude Zero to uh, write programs. And uh, then I started to write DynTK, uh, the little toolkit that was supposed to replace NTK. Uh, being very naive and not knowing what NTK is capable of. So uh, a year later, I went to Tokyo to the Newton conference, and uh, uh, that's where Paul actually dropped the bomb. He made uh, Einstein open source, and uh, that was so cool, and I was so happy about it. And uh, he told us on the first day uh, at noon, it's open source right now, um, Let's see what we do with it. And, and I was so keen on doing something. I was staying in one of the most expensive hotels in Tokyo with a, a great spa and everything, which I never saw because I spent the night programming and uh, rewriting the user interface so it would run on Windows. And the next morning already, uh, I had a version running on uh, my little Slate computer. And that's how I got into the whole Einstein thing. Um, I was still slow back then. Oh my God. Um, by now everything got so much faster. So how does Einstein work? Einstein is, um, uh, an emulator, which means it really, uh, uses the original ROM in, in very verbatim, uh, mode. And, uh, the thing though that amazed me and that, that, uh, really got me into the whole Newton OS thing, um, Newton was already planned with licensing in mind. So they had something called ROM extensions. So you could buy the operating system, Newton OS, and then add your driver for your own um, screen or your own keyboard or your own, I don't know, serial port. And, and that made it possible that you could, uh, uh, that Paul actually wrote uh, not the hardware emulation of the screen, but he wrote a plugin in one of those ROM extensions that would take care of the screen. And that made the whole emulator work really nicely. I don't know if I explained that right, but it's, it's a really cool system. And, and Paul managed to get uh, all the uh, very down basic hardware stuff together combined in a very nice way into the Newton uh, operating system. The alternatives, um, maybe I should mention Mat that. Matthias, do you want yeah. me to step in and, and give more details about this part? Yeah. Um, indeed, the, the ROM extent, sorry, this is Paul uh, speaking. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm so happy to, to watch this conference. Thank you all. Uh, indeed, the, the ROM extension thing, the one ROM extension trick was what made uh, developing Einstein possible because uh, there was no documentation about how the Newton hardware actually works. And still, some of the bits we still don't know because uh, we haven't reverse engineered the old hardware. 
but the way we got it working back in 2004, so 16 years ago, uh, okay, I'm starting the video. Sorry. Can you see me? Yeah. So the, the, the way we got it working at that time was indeed because we, we could use all these um, uh, documentation well, that I got under the hood by other developers of how to uh, build these clones we've seen on the, the um, Apple Polish Museum. And uh, so Apple designed some documentation that was incomplete and uh, some stuff wasn't there. But to allow um, Siemens uh, and uh, Motorola to, to build the Newton clones. And so Einstein is somehow a kind of Newton clone uh, for this part. We just built drivers that just replaced the original driver. Uh, and so I hadn't had to find out how the screen hardware exactly works or the flash uh, lowest uh, parts driver actually works and so on. So I got it working. So my is just giving you back there. Yeah, cool. Oh. I mean, uh, uh, it's 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 fun to see, and when I look through the source code, it's it's so amazing to to uh, understand all this and see all the thought that was put in there by by the Apple engineers too, and and how it was really meant to to stick around. I mean, all implementing all this takes a lot of time off of your uh, 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 the, what the user sees, and uh, this was really cool. I mean, I I did a lot of Amiga stuff back then in the days, and they never looked forward very much. It was uh, just trying to get the next machine out as quickly as possible. So very different approach. So what happened in the beginning of this year is uh, that someone had the great idea that um, paper, uh, electronic paper e-ink devices are now fast enough and good enough to run Einstein. And uh, they really are nice uh, message pad replacements because they're very similar in, uh, in the idea with long battery life and not that much going on on screen and really only a touch interface or pen interface. So I've tried to get that going uh, by, by rewriting large parts of the Android port because it was just slow. And while I was doing this, uh, I was trying to avoid any Android code. And that's, that's a, a general thing that hit me then in January or so, that the Windows version did not have a user interface or much of a user interface. The Linux version had uh, either just X11, just a screen, and not much of a user interface either. And the Mac version has a beautiful interface. Um, and, and, and maintaining all of this, making a release for all four platforms and then plus iOS, it's just really difficult for a software engineer. So I got uh, distracted from the Android port and tried to unify uh, uh, the whole development. And, and I originally, or I, I developed a cross-platform user interface library with uh, people from, uh, special effects time called FLTK, which is not beautiful. Uh, it's also 25 years old, um, but it has the huge advantage that it's it's very small and it just does its job. And so one of the new things is that uh, all users on all platforms uh, now have a complete user interface, the exact same user interface on every platform. And that also made it possible to uh, port um, something called the monitor which is kind of a debugger that goes uh, deep into the operating system. And I added some, some little stuff that now works on every platform. And I think that makes life easier. Let me see if I get the share screen going again. Uh, I hope you can see. Uh, yeah, we can, we can see everything here. Yeah, everything's fine. Okay, cool. So you see the first thing is a very untypical for Mac OS. It has the menu here. Um, I will, just, this can be optional, but one thing that is nice now, you can just scale your screen. So it's just such a simple Great. thing, but it never worked. So now you can just do that and you can go full screen and all these things. Then uh, Mac users are used to that, but Windows and Linux users are not. Uh, we have a settings dialog where we can actually go and um, 
uh, choose a ROM now. You can choose a ROM file and I have tested with all the ROM files I can find. And if you have a broken ROM, it will say unknown ROM. If you have a file that's, um, you see, uh, the, the debugging images, for example, it will tell you right away uh, what uh, ROM you're having and if you have a faulty ROM. And I think that will make life easier for a lot of people who try uh, the emulator for the first time. Of course, there's no download link for the ROM or anything, but uh, I don't think I have to explain that. You can change the screen size. And I have tried to take uh, all settings out of here because most of the settings are not needed anyway. And this is all you need to get the emulator running. Um, what I did was, uh, some of you may have seen this uh, network PCMCIA card up here. Um, that now works on all platforms, including uh, on Android. So you can uh, just um, click on this and that answer, uh, um, just puts a PCMCIA Ethernet card into the uh, emulator. And uh, with the right driver packages, you can just go online and go on the internet with Einstein. Um, the other thing that I changed was um, we have, uh, of course, the serial port, which, yeah, modern computers don't have serial ports anymore. So I thought, what's the best way to emulate the serial port? And I made it into a TCP IP connection and a network connection. And so when you go on the dock menu and you stay in serial mode, then this will still use a TCP IP connection. And um, I don't know if synchronizing software on the other end is up to, uh, up to date yet, but theoretically you can synchronize uh, um, with NCX and all other tools uh, just using a network connection. And that's great when you have an Android uh, computer. You can, you can just uh, use your phone and connect uh, wirelessly to your main computer and synchronize. And of course, this is uh, later than important, important when we wanna do some development because also the development system runs over the serial port, which is now uh, redirected to TCP IP. And, um, then I saw, I said earlier, I didn't want all the settings here. You know, the settings are, are the, 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 for someone who uses this for the first time, I don't want to have my, many settings here, like choosing a driver for the screen or all this stuff. So I removed it and I started rewriting this uh, in a an, an, um, Newton app. And so I wrote Einstein preferences and right now there's not much in there, but you can change the serial port driver. And so you can say the serial port, I want none, or I want it uh, directly connect to Bezalisk or uh, as a network client. And the network client is now the standard version. And if you set the server to something on the network, you can connect to any computer on your network and just do development. So you can have your phone uh, as your virtual or your platform and your uh, PC right next to it as a developer machine. Um, by doing this, I learned a lot about programming and uh, it's really cool. I mean, it's fun to program for this little machine, but I'll talk about that later. All right. Um, one, yeah, then it's tiny stuff that once you have a unified uh, user interface, uh, you can add features and they will be on every platform. So you can install software on this right now just by drag and drop. So you just take a package file that you have on your desktop somewhere. I don't know if I have one here. Mm. Uh, I just take the package, drop it, and it will install it. Of course, you won't. It's already on there. But uh, you can, uh, if you download or have the Una, uh, Una how, how do you guys pronounce that? Una, <laughs> Una uh, archive. You can just drag and drop one application after the other and just try them out. It's it's really nice. It makes life a lot easier. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, one little thing that a lot of people asked for is just the volume slider now works on every platform. And uh, Einstein remembers what the setting is uh, when you relaunch it. I think, uh, yeah, I was <laughs> really asked by several people to do it. Okay, how do I get the image back? 
Okay. Ha, wonderful. Okay. Um, for developers who want to try Einstein and do changes on Einstein, um, it now works with uh, CMake. Um, most people won't know what that is, but CMake is pretty cool. It works on every platform and allows uh, to develop uh, very quickly. You just, it's, it's a few mouse clicks and you can compile Einstein on your computer. Um, let me see what I forgot. Okay, yeah, I wanted, um, uh, wanted to sh give you a little glimpse at the monitor thing, that monitor that I was talking about earlier. So the monitor is part of Einstein. And I can open it and already has a lot of mumbo jumbo on it. And you can press on stop here. And you see down here are uh, the arm risk instructions that Einstein is currently executing. And you can really go step by step. And so for, for, for this, we we'll have never seen the monitor before. It was designed after MaxBug interface, which I was a great fan of. So uh, this is the reason why there is the registers at the top left and then the other registers and the way it's working. So it's entirely based on, on MaxBug. And you can get the symbols because uh, Matthias used uh, a debug ROM. So if you use a debug ROM, Einstein is able to, to get the symbols and get the symbols when it's ascending. Yeah, the symbols are fantastic. I mean, you can really single step through everything. You can set breakpoints uh, where execution just stops. And if the emulation doesn't work, you find out where it doesn't work, where it chokes, and, and you can fix it. And you can also go through the entire uh, assembly code and, and understand how the system works. And I have learned uh, so incredibly much using this. Uh, it's also, nothing's copy protected on the original device. So uh, downloading the ROM, you can just send it through a disassembler and, and read it. And it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, you get used to the abbreviations after a while and it gets relatively easy to understand. And uh, with the developer ROM um, that Paul just mentioned, it has a lot of symbol information. So you can look at the original C++ names that were used to write the code. And that makes it really uh, sometimes obvious, sometimes easy to understand what's going on. And that brings me a little bit on, on a sideline. Uh, of course, there was always the idea of, oh, can't we just recover the source code? Can't we uncompile uh, what has been compiled? Uh, can't we undo it? Uh, unfortunately, this is not so easy. Um, and I don't know if it would make sense either. Um, we are at the point now that uh, I would say we understand pretty much everything that's going on on the message pad as a community, not me alone, oh gosh. Um, and, and with uh, existing tools, including Newt Zero, um, we could probably rewrite uh, large parts of the experience and then we would get rid of uh, all dependencies on the ROM. And I think that would be an amazing thing and that would actually make the whole thing possible, make it, poss make it possible to put Einstein in, um, in the app store. And that brings me to the other thing, the iOS drama. Uh, the iOS drama is uh, really sad and, and uh, it's unfortunate to see that Apple doesn't really care at all about uh, the whole system. I mean, it's not loved, I understand that, but uh, you have car manufacturers like, say, Audi, who have a huge support system, so you can, they're actually recreating spare parts for their old cars because they're so proud of them. Apple, unfortunately, has none of those sentiments, and uh, uh, we explicitly got kicked out of, or not never let into the App Store to begin with. And uh, the iOS uh, system or idea is that Apple makes a lot of money by uh, uh, being the only provider or the only way to get software officially onto the iPads. And um, this route for us is closed. Um, the restrictions to the App Store 
uh, are um, that uh, apps that you want to put on there cannot be emulators. Mm. Bad luck because emulators execute uh, code that Apple can control. Well, also the Apple ROM is of course Apple copyright code. So that is the next problem. You can't have copyrighted by someone else's code on the App Store. And um, uh, also uh, they don't want any software on there that emulates other Apple software. Well, yeah, by definition, that's exactly what Einstein does. So the chance of Einstein getting onto the App Store is uh, currently uh, zero unless someone really wants to try and talk to someone or talk someone into it uh, at Apple themselves in a pretty high position. That would be pretty amazing because uh, I think um, without the message pad, the iPad would have never been possible. So it would be really cool to see it and to see it with the pencil working. And I think it would help Apple uh, to show more of the history. Okay. Um, Oh yeah, one other thing. <laughs> uh, th th I think the the the, the um, I totally underestimate it when you when you write a software in two thousand four, um, how things change over the years and and um, yeah, my my hair was darker back then and uh, so was my uh, speed with developing software, and all of a sudden out of nowhere, it's only announced for three years. That's for me in my age, it's like nothing. After three years, you find out that Apple no longer supports 32-bit software. And of course, Einstein by itself uh, is a 32-bit 32 32 app. And um, so these are the things you have to continuously keep watching. And I hope that with the new system, with CMake and everything, we will be able to develop Einstein uh, more consistently and bring out a new version maybe every year. So uh, we stay up to par with what the developers at Apple and Microsoft and the Linux systems do. Okay, uh, I hope I haven't forgotten too much. Um, so the question, where can this go? And uh, I have to admit that a lot of my recent activity is uh, definitely to some pandemic. I don't know if you heard about that, but we have to stay at home a lot. And that gave me uh, the time to actually uh, work on this. I don't know how this is going to be in the future, but uh, going through Einstein, I have a few things that I would like to add. And the one thing, the one really big goal for me is to get a mobile version going that preferably works on iOS and Android really well so that uh, people just really tap on it and can use it in day-to-day -day, uh, business, can sync and can have fun uh, doing, getting some 90s feeling on their super modern devices. Uh, that's probably the ultimate goal, but until then, uh, I do want to get the patches for the ROM for the Y10K bug uh, applied directly in Einstein. Um, I don't know, you guys probably don't know the details about this bug, but what happens is uh, the Newton counts the time in seconds uh, since a specific date and integers, uh, so small numbers on uh, the Newton OS are only um, 30 bits and not 32 bits. And these two bits are really missing. And so the timer wraps around, I think, every 16 years. So the Y10K bug becomes the Y26K bug pretty soon. And um, we will have to update the patch software. So I'm hoping that uh, we can integrate it into Einstein. So whoever loads the ROM into Einstein doesn't even know about this bug and it just is fixed. So that would be pretty cool. Um, what I also want to do, and that's uh, also to have the system perfect, is uh, when you put an appointment in, it doesn't really help you much if Einstein is not running in the background. So it would be nice to have something that wakes up Einstein uh, when an appointment is actually reached and uh, make the system go. Um, I'll talk about uh, development a little bit later, and I think that works already pretty well. Uh, in, an, in a perfect world, I would love to integrate a uh, developer environment into uh, Einstein directly so you don't even have to run a second software. Uh, Newton script is 
pretty cool to develop with uh, and pretty frustrating at the same time. But having everything in the same app, we could actually write new programs. That would be pretty fun. Mm, we're missing some help pages, some documentation. I still have to do a lot of work on uh, documenting how to build Einstein for those people who find bugs and want to change them and uh, uh, add fixes. And uh, yeah, documentation, documentation, documentation. I wrote it three times. It uh, reminds me of some guy at Microsoft who yelled, developers, developers, developers. And uh, that, yeah, I just want to just iterate on that story a little bit. When, when I got the message pad and the developer environment back then cost $900, I think, uh, that was so frustrating. And it really kept a lot of people on putting software on the machine and I'm always surprised that we do have 50 games uh, and a lot of other apps. All those people at some point must have paid those uh, $900 entry fee to uh, write a better version of tic-tac-toe. I find that pretty frustrating. But uh, on the other hand, the cool thing is we can do this all now for free and uh, the system is amazing and it's great fun and uh, so it hasn't tried Einstein yet, I really recommend it. Uh, it's, it's cool and uh, the Android version will be out in, in the week, uh, latest two weeks, that's the plan. So yeah, so I don't think I filled uh, the hour. <laughs> but um, if, if there are questions or if I can go into more detail with stuff, please let me know. Does anybody have any questions for Matthias? Matthias, I just want to say that that was a really great presentation. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I love about the Newton is that it takes people who are users and just really like the experience. And then it also takes people who are developers who just really love working on the platform and, and making cool things. Who's, who has some questions? I have a question. Sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> it's okay, uh, it's fine, it's fine. This is a well-behaved group. I'm really surprised. <laughs> yes. All right. So um, you mentioned there's a lot of deep technical background knowledge in the community. Um, and then you also mentioned we need documentation. Where um, all, I, all I've done is use Newton. I haven't done any development at all. So where do we start what, if, as noobs, I guess, to start learning the deep under, underpinnings? Yeah, um, um, I, I've, I've put some effort into uh, explaining how to uh, install Einstein on every machine, uh, but I'm not a publisher or anything. And, and my web page, if you look at it, is, is very, very basic. And uh, uh, it would be just nice um, to have better videos and better explanations how that works. Um, my bigger part on, on writing documentation is probably on the developer side that uh, if someone wants to come in and say, oh, I, would, I have a great idea for Einstein, but how do I compile it? So I, I will have to put that together and, and write it all down. I have a tendency, uh, I don't know if other software engineers are the same, but I have a tendency uh, once I get into the groove and I write uh, software, I just uh, write and write and write and write. And then I wake up uh, a few hours later from the groove and it's, uh, it's like, oh, I, got, I forgot to document it. Now I'm tired. I go to bed. And um, uh, uh, then going back the next day and trying to retrace the steps I did was usually pretty difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a common experience for any developer. <laughs> Cool. Um, <clears throat> one other one other question. Have you done, uh, you, you've been testing the Android version. Have you done any uh, any of the ePaper Android products? And do you have a recommendation for one that would be good? Um, yeah, I have a, a um I have one ePaper machine here. Um, I don't want to give a recommendation just yet. But uh, generally, the faster the processor, the better, because the emulation is still at a ratio of probably 100 to 1. So one instruction on, of the original message pad takes probably 100 or more instructions on the real machine. So it has to be a lot faster. Um, uh, it should have a pen, obviously, to make the experience nice. And uh, I think um, what I will do is um, the Android version has a system inside uh, to make it possible to tune 
Einstein for specific devices so that uh, whoever finds the best settings, the best screen refresh rate, the best uh, um, uh, memory settings, um, that we collect that and put it in and then have a list of supported devices. And, and I think that's, that, that would be the best path. Nice. What, what about Android version? Is there a, a minimum or? Uh, yeah, but it's very low. Um, we, I'm using um, uh, the, the native uh, activity, which is, was introduced in, oh gosh, I don't know, API 9 or something really early. And um, the resources, I, I try to stay away from anything that is Android specific. Uh, from my experience that if you write for five platforms at once and you have a, a pl platform specific code in every platform, it drives you nuts. And so I'm trying to, to really get the user interface on mobile devices into a, a, a Newton script package, which helps me learn Newton script and also makes it uh, really cool to set the preferences with a little uh, Newton app. And on the desktop machines, it's just easier to have it external, have a regular UI. Thank you so much. Um, I think Jonathan, are you waiting to talk? Yeah. Hey, uh, so I was able to compile from source on Mac and Android. Cool. Um, the current Android version, and uh, this was a couple months ago, so maybe it's not the current Android version, doesn't work properly on 9 or 10 because of um, some notification issue. I stopped short of submitting a pull request because my solution was a little hacky, but maybe this is solved with your new UI work. Uh, yes, this is... Um... Uh, uh, if anyone's going to the GitHub, all the work I have been doing in the recent time is on uh, the Matt 2020 branch. I didn't put it on the main branch. Uh, I talked to Paul because I uh, destroyed some of the stuff he did, some of the original user interface, so I decided to do a branch. And uh, also on the Android version, um, I decided to, we had this, um, system that you had like a, a access to the menu by going through the notification bar. I removed that entirely um, because it didn't work on, on uh, depending on which version of Android you had. And um, with the new version, that's why that all moved into uh, Einstein Prefs, the Newton script app. So Perfect. there's not gonna be any of those tricks anymore. I tried to avoid that. So okay, we can I think pull that, pull that branch and compile from that, and we'll get your latest. Yeah, you can you can pull uh, Matt twenty twenty, and then uh, there's two Android uh, setups. The one is the original that I left alone, and then there's a, a native Android uh, which uses the the native activity interface. It's a completely different, or it's a complete rewrite of uh, how the screen is handled. It's uh, the speed improvement of the screen is probably about five times in the best conditions and that really helps uh, to get it uh, working on e-ink e devices. Awesome, thanks. Good, okay, so I think Jake has a question. Jake, do you have a question? Unmute now. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think I think um, Matthias covered a lot of what, what I uh, what I was going to say. Hi, my name is Jake Bordens, by the way. Um, <laughs> also, an older contributor to uh, Einstein. Um, you know, there's um, you know, my interest has been um, mainly keeping the old hardware relevant. Um, and my presentation tomorrow talks a little bit more about the uh, capabilities of the expansion slot. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in Einstein, uh, that I was just curious, are we going to rip out like uh, stuff that I wrote, like the objective C bridge, where you could literally call the entire objective C API from within Newton script, um, a little arduous, but you could do it. Um, I think that a lot of those bits of code could probably be retired, um, in, in favor of kind of the more cross-platform approach. Um, you know, I put that in there back when uh, Apple Pencil, um, you know, came out and I wanted a way to trigger like a, a context menu in iOS oh, to cool. be able to bring up, you know, settings screens and things like that. But if we're going to move to an all, um, I, I'm, I'm, it's probably just another trap that you're using for, for your, um, you know, your, your cross 
uh, emulator communication back to the host OS. But um, there's probably some stuff we can remove that uh, probably isn't impacting performance, but probably isn't necessary anymore. Uh, yeah, I saw the Objective-C bridge and um, I, uh, in my version currently, it's not in, um, not because I didn't like it. I uh, didn't want to have any uh, system specific code in there for the time being. It's no problem to put it back in um, if it's needed. Uh, yes, you're right. I did uh, write a new module. It's uh, in platform tnewt.cpp. And um, it, it allows to uh, have Newton script call anything within Einstein uh, that you create an interface for. And it also provides uh, uh, an interface from Einstein into the Newton system memory. So you can uh, have Einstein uh, just uh, grab a string inside a running Newton OS and uh, grab any data out of it. And that works uh, surprisingly well. And, and that's how uh, Einstein Prefs also works. Of course, Einstein Prefs would not work on an original machine because it uh, needs those traps, as you say. Um, uh, but that system has proven to work uh, very well. And uh, it's also taught me how, um, what I mentioned earlier, if we want to get to the point that we don't need the ROM anymore and just use new zero, uh, you can really look into the guts and look into the, the little details of uh, what Newton OS is doing. That's a great yeah. interview. I think that's a, a better approach because, uh, you know, I, I'm not as altruistic. I write for the platforms that I use. And so, um, you know, a more cross-platform approach is probably better. The other comment I would have is, you know, something you mentioned that is, you know, I hate to, to raise problems without solutions, but the sync uh, element that you talked about before is something that I've been thinking about um, over the years and just don't have the time to really tackle but even with with physical hardware it would be I think really interesting to have like a host again platforms I use a host iOS app that communicates back over a Bluetooth low energy connection similar to the way the Apple watch does so that you know even if you got your original message pad or you got your uh, message pad 2000 um, you can still get your calendar, uh, your contacts, and your other things because just like the Apple Watch syncs to a host app, uh, yeah. a little bit more. There's certain, only so much you can do, um, again, to your points about Apple's walled garden, but um, you can do an awful lot. There have been other, um, um, there have been other like, uh, you know, third party products that, that use this model because the Bluetooth low energy stack on the iPhone will remain running. Uh, and watch for connections from a third third party device. So, you know, as we start to build the sync infrastructure, maybe for Einstein, um, you know, I'd love to to see it also be uh, usable by on the hardware side as well. Uh, we would have to build interfacing hardware, um, and I know you have some thoughts on that as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a problem that like you know is one of the things that has me not using my physical Newtons as much is that my data just isn't there. And uh, the old sync metaphor doesn't really do it for me anymore. So having like a real time communication between devices would be really cool. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, um, the synchronization is is a big issue. And uh, um, from the Einstein side, it would be no problem to uh, use Bluetooth uh, for communication. but. The part that I did so far is just replacing the existing serial port with uh, network communication. You could just do that with Bluetooth. That would be uh, the, the, the same dish uh, served differently. What we then really need is, as you say, an app on the other side that helps uh, Newton OS to be more modern and have access to more data. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, we could emulate uh, flashcards, flash memory, um, so that when uh, Newton OS accesses it, it thinks it's just a flashcard, but in reality, it's uh, access to our the address book of the host machine, for example. And in real time, the host machine would present uh, the entire address book just as if it was a soup. Kind of a 
soup on the fly and uh, things like that are possible. It's really a question of, of time. And, and uh, also uh, one thing, yeah, that I mentioned, didn't mention in my speech, um, it's, a, it's a, a, a matter of feedback. Uh, I have, for example, no idea how many people use Einstein and I have no idea how many develop for it and how many use it often or just once a month to see if it still runs. That would be pretty cool. So feedback would be a, an, an awesome thing. And um, either way, I'm, I'm really looking forward to your presentation tomorrow. And uh, so with the communication part, I hope we can do something that then runs on physical devices and on Einstein in a very similar way. So when we develop the software for it, it would run, uh, run on both machines. That would be cool. I think Paul I think has a, oh sorry go ahead Jake I think that I think that's great I want to thank you for all your hard work because uh, you know I, since I've had children I have had a lot less time to do fun side <laughs> projects like this so uh, thanks for thanks for all your efforts I've, I someday uh, you know hope, hope to match your contributions because uh, it, it, it's just fantastic some of the work you've done. Thank, uh, thank you. I give that right back. I mean, the, the, so many people have been contributing to Einstein and it's just uh, uh, great fun. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an awesome piece of work. Uh, again, thanks to Paul. Uh, uh, I learned a lot about uh, writing in a very sordid way. And uh, the, in my job, uh, my, my partner that I wrote software with, he was uh, very chaotic and it was very different to write software with him. So uh, it's good to see uh, clean and orderly code. It's fun. <laughs> I think Paul has a comment and then uh, Powell wants to talk. Paul. Uh, yes, uh, I was just, um, Silva had a question on the chat about uh, Watson, whether Einstein would work with Watson ROM. And uh, I just wanted to answer this question uh, on audio so everyone gets the answer. So Watson, Watson uh, is, I think the topic of Sylvan's talk is going to display one. It's a French um, uh, PDA that was developed for the medical system with uh, the French OS2 or OS2.1, something like this. And, uh, and uh, I tried to, to get Watson working on Watson ROMs working on Einstein. But the, the thing is, it seems that Watson was uh, just a little bit further in terms of versioning of Newton OS, just like 2.2 or something like this. And uh, I, so far, I failed to get it working. But the jump table, well, to, to get into technical details, but the jump table is quite different. Nevertheless, it would be an interesting challenge to get it working on Einstein. Powell, what would you like to say? Matthias, I have actually a few, uh, a few questions, three, because one of the questions is from our viewers. Um, it's about um, networking card uh, building in the, in the um, uh, Einstein. So uh, uh, when they click uh, the um, network icon, uh, some error coming out. So I think it's a matter of um, kind of driver. Could you explain that quickly? Sure. Yeah, that's easy. Easy to explain. Um, it uh, the Newton by itself does not understand what uh, uh, does understand what a PCMCIA card is, but it doesn't know the different cards. So you have to have, install a driver um, that uh, specifically corresponds to the card that you want to install, and. Um, uh, it's on my other page on MatthiasM.com. It's explained how to do it, but I'll move that documentation over to uh, messagepad.org tonight and uh, including the driver that you have to install. It's, it's uh, confusingly called uh, na2k.package, but it has, uh, because it's emulating one of those cards, but the original na2k driver does not work. It has to be the one that comes from my page. I will uh, put that on messagepad.org tonight. Right, so uh, we need to install that specific driver. And then after this, when I click on the icon, the information about the, that virtual network uh, card will show up. Am I yes. correct? Yes, great. Okay, yes. so uh, my uh, another question is about, because you mentioned during, during the presentation that uh, you, 
theoretically or, or practically uh, are able at this moment to rewrite the code of the Newton OS. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for my ignorance, I'm not a programmer. I'm, I, I just, I'm just starting with this. But um, my question is about the, you mentioned also about uh, that Apple don't care about the old stuff, old um, software, etc. And my question is a little tricky and maybe some of you will laugh, but I, I'm gonna ask that question. Do you think it's a possible to ask Apple as a group, uh, us as a group, ask Apple to release uh, the code for us or something that could give us a, a not any problem with the copyrights? Mm. Um, I think there, there are several levels of, of what would be helpful and, and the first and lowest level would be uh, to be allowed to just use the ROM. And I know that early Macintosh ROMs have been released and made available for, by Apple for use in emulators. So they have been doing this. It's uh, not unheard of. Uh, if they would say, hey, whatever, just integrate the ROM into Einstein and we're all fine. Um, that would already be uh, a fantastic step that would make it much easier for people who have no idea about Einstein to at least try Newton out. Yeah, So not to try to find where do I get the ROM file and so on. I mean, we all know it's online in several locations. It's part of the developer kit, uh, but uh, still officially uh, it's, it's not there, so someone who runs it has to find it. That would be the first level. The next level would be then to say, uh, it doesn't really harm iOS if we have this running on iOS. You can do it, you can put it in the, in the app store. And uh, then the third level, and that's what you're saying, that would be uh, crazy as hell if we would get access to the source code. I mean, that would be insane. Um, and I think pretty much unheard of, but on the other hand, uh, it would be crazy. And I think if that would be happening, uh, I'd probably spend a year uh, taking off uh, my job and, and just uh, making sure it compiles on modern machines. <laughs> um, I don't, uh, it would be amazing. I'm afraid that some of the stuff uh, is uh, probably not even Apple property. Uh, definitely, I know about the old uh, character recognition, handwriting recognition system. I think that was never, uh, I don't know if Apple ever had the source for that, so they couldn't publish that. And also things like word lists and so on. I don't know if they're owned or licensed by Apple, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a big mix. And I wonder, uh, have be, having been in software development for, for uh, 30 years, uh, if the software the source code is actually still current and complete somewhere. Right. Okay. So uh, thanks very much for this. Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, mm, thank you very much for that answer. Because, you know, my idea was to maybe, I know maybe it's a, a little naive, but maybe, I don't know, try to kind of pet petition or something like this and ask Apple about this. Yeah, it could be, it could be really great because, because you uh, and other programmers you're doing a really great job and I want to join to the um, previous person who, who, who said that uh, I'm, for me, it's a magic. Yeah. It's a magic and for me, it's like a black magic even. <laughs> so, but I'm so happy because I'm using uh, Einstein practically every day somehow. I'm testing a lot of things, especially I start learning a Newton script now. So I'm, I'm, I'm making a, a small steps. I, I just managed to write my first uh, Hello World application. That was awesome experience. So uh, for me, our work is awesome. And uh, if you guys need uh, any support or something, don't, please don't hesitate to ask the community. I think a lot of people will agree with me. If, you, if, if we can help in somehow uh, in, in this project, feel free to ask us because uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's cre in, in, incredible, yeah? Okay, thank you very much. I'm quiet now. 
Well, you mentioned earlier, I said that, yeah, uh, it would be possible to rewrite uh, most of it. Uh, it's uh, so-called, it's, uh, it would theoretically have to be a clean room approach, meaning you can only look at the system from the outside. You're not allowed to know the inside. And then someone tells you it does this and that, and then you have to sit down and program it. Uh, but I would say that's easily uh, four or five man years uh, that go into this, even with the knowledge we have. So realistically, we will not be able to rewrite the entire system, but it's, it's not only an app, it is just an operating system. So uh, many parts would not have to be rewritten and the stuff that brings uh, apps on screen uh, shows windows, uh, accesses the soups. I think that is definitely writable. And, and uh, if, if the time allows, uh, I will make a little approach. A lot has been done by New Zero uh, and, and, other, and other developers. So um, I, I think with me having done user interface internals for such a long time, I should be able to write something or hack something together at least. It will never feel exactly like uh, Newton, but uh, it may work. I don't know. It's worth a try. Thank you. Hey guys, this is, this is Jake again. Um, I just wanted to say that there's, there are, uh, to that end, there, there are, there's plenty of, I think that enthusiasm breeds enthusiasm and events like this I think are, are key to that. I mean, uh, it, it, every time something like this comes along, it gets me excited and I dust my stuff off and I, uh, I play with it for a couple of weeks and, um, you know, uh, you know, it just, I, I think that, and there, there are levels where anyone can contribute. Uh, you know, I know that there have been idea, uh, ideas in the past about having a database of, of the ROM symbols and, you know, that, that would just be like web work, uh, more or less. But every time I reverse engineer, uh, a ROM function that, you know, uh, one of my goals tomorrow is to share everything I know about, <laughs> like, for example, the serial slot, so that, you know, maybe someone else can, um, you know, make use of it. Uh, but, you know, we don't have a central place where we're putting all of this sure. material, uh, which I think Mat Matthias is trying to really um, solve with his messagepad.org. But, you know, I've, I've written tons of little scripts over the years. We've, I've disassembled the ROM more times than I can count. Uh, but I, I in, inevitably do a lot of rework uh, because I forget. Uh, and, and so, you know, if you're interested, um, we have the Slack channel. Um, you know, I check in there from time to time. Uh, I don't know others do as well. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, you don't have to be a, you know, arm assembly uh, engineer to, to, to contribute. Um, there, there's all sorts of uh, opportunities that could, you know, from, from administrative to, uh, you know, uh, you know, all the way up to like disassembling the ROM and figuring out how things work. So, so don't be intimidated. Um, please, if you're, if you're interested, uh, do contribute. We have a couple questions from, uh, we have four questions. Um, Nils, did you want to say something? Oh, no, sorry. That was a mistake from my side. Okay, next. <laughs> um, Pearly. I don't uh, no, sorry. Uh, I, that was back when. Oh, this uh, was from before. The, okay. The question, good. yeah, about who uh, uses um, Einstein. Yep. Oh, that's good. Um, do we want to do that again? Everybody put up your hand if you've used Einstein. Wish Virtual or Einstein. real. And if you want, who's the, now who's developed for Einstein? Who's developed something? Sort of, yes, yes. Okay, so there's actually a fairly good number. Say maybe like a third of a third to half of people have used Einstein, and a s smaller subset of that have um, done some development work. That's pretty cool. Cool. Um, Steve, did you want to say something? 84 TV. Sure. Uh, just had a quick question. Uh, I remember hearing around the time when the original iPad came out uh, that there were rumors to the effect that the original source or uh, part of the source of the Newton operating system was either damaged or lost at a hard disk in Apple, or they just for some reason couldn't locate it. I'm curious if anybody else picked that up. Maybe it's just a figment of my imagination, but uh, I recall hearing that uh, to some degree years ago. 
this conversation is actually happening in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I posted that, but uh, curious. <laughs> uh, so, uh, like I said, the uh, the source code for every release was put on a CD-ROM, and that went somewhere. Uh, <laughs> um, and I I assume it's still there. I, it's a it's a CD-ROM, so I don't you know maybe it's dead, but it isn't. It isn't that it was lost on a hard drive. I, don't, I hope it's not lost at all. Um, but there was something that was lost that way that I did hear about, but it was a much older thing. It, what I'm remembering is like either the super serial card for the Apple II or maybe like the, what was that ink, that uh, that thermal printer? The, oh, the, the laser slide. jet? No, 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 thermal. Like the, the style writer, is that a thing? Mm. The image writer? So. Anyway, something that old, I think, <laughs> the source code was, was, was I heard lost. And that's actually why they got really serious about archiving source code, uh, uh, this sort of more formal mechanism. So every time we, we made a ROM, we would also make a CD-ROM of the source sort of all in one place that you could theoretically build from. I don't know if anyone ever tried to build from it, but. We should, what if we could like on Newtons, we should like try, if we, the ROMs are truly lost, we could try, what, what if we could like extract them from our Newtons and then like do the little patchings that are like blank and like source code or whatever. <laughs> I think that's what that Matthias does all day. <laughs> what? what yeah, that's that's pretty much what we're doing all day. Uh, yeah. uh, Jake does it too and, and uh, um, I, the, 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 this assembly uh, is really easy to make and uh, I think I have pages filled with uh, annotations uh, that should be centralized somewhere because I think someone else has probably made pages, other pages with annotations. Uh, that would be pretty cool. Uh, I know from my own experience, we saved uh, pretty important software on that tape, digital audio tape, uh, only to find out years later that they would only read back on one very specific device because the read head was askew. And that device died, and uh, with it died all our source code. So, uh, yeah, CD-ROMs, I don't know. I think they live 20 years, right? Then they start to dissolve or something. They, they were gold. I remember that. Oh, okay. Well, then, wow. then gold, then they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So who, wants to, who else wants to ask the question? I know Lord Groundhog had one. Uh, actually, we have a few hands raised, so if you could... Yeah. Hang on, we can't hear you. Do you have a sequence of people you want? I clicked you because you were at the top of the screen, so you can go okay. now. <laughs> okay, I will do. Um, on Einstein, I was wondering, one of the things that's really important to the way I use my Einstein is the way the data is all able to be integrated so tightly between apps. Is that still in Einstein? Uh, yes, of course. That's, this always stays the same. Einstein really uh, emulates everything around the Newton OS. It doesn't change the Newton OS. Okay. Um, one thing I was thinking about, I don't know if anyone's interested in that. I know that some people use uh, several flash files. So they have like a, a one uh, Einstein version for drawing, one for writing, one for playing. Um, we could make an interface for that if people use that. If nobody uses it, then an additional interface is just confusing. Okay, and if I could just ask another quick one. How does, how does the handwriting recognition in Einstein sub deal with the handwriting recognition in a note, for example? Because I'm, I'm using notes. I've got two phones, they're both notes. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, this thing really doesn't like my handwriting, and yet I take this thing out and it's like, like somebody else said, black magic, you know, it's just, <laughs> poof, it's there. Um, so does the Einstein emulator suppress the handwriting recognition in the, in the Samsung or what happens there? Oh, uh, that's, that's really interesting that you asked that because, um, uh, uh, the, the code is exactly the same. We use the, the code that is in the ROM. Um, what is different though is uh, that depending on your computer, um, Einstein is a lot slower or maybe a lot faster. So um, the, the, at the rate at which it is digitized is different. So uh, a round O may become uh, an octagon uh, and no longer be recognized by the system. Um, we were actually thinking about 
what you're asking, what we're doing is uh, to see if the host system has uh, text recognition and offer that the user can use that instead because it's integrated in the system. It usually is faster and maybe better, but uh, that would not be an easy task. It, yeah, for me, it, it doesn't work that way. For me, my Newton knows exactly what to do. <laughs> and in, right from the very first moment, I picked up somebody else's Newton mm. um, at our, our um, Mac user group back in, what was it, 2003 yeah. or something. And he, he had a, a, several of them. And he said, you know, try it. I tried it. And it was yeah. like, where has this thing been all my life? Why didn't I get one of these 10 years ago? Yeah. Um, this thing's supposed to be the bee's knees and you know, I, I, I'm writing and then I rewrite and then I rewrite again. And then I just say, forget about it. And I get frustrated. Yeah. Right away. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> For me, it's uh, sometimes the other way around. Uh, uh, Newton doesn't really like my handwriting and my Samsung uh, is, is okay with it, but ooh. yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> my, uh, okay, well, thank you. Anecdote. I was just say a funny anecdote is that uh, some people like my wife tell, tells me, tell me that my handwriting is like a, a little girl. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think the reason is, is because I trained my, I did so much writing on the Newton uh, that, you know, my handwriting is very, very uh, curvy and, you know, just like, you know, it influenced my handwriting style. Uh, and, you know, I think that the, the learning, uh, that that Newton does against your handwriting is really moderate. It, I think that I learn more uh, better penmanship from the Newton than the Newton ever learned my, <laughs> my poor penmanship. So we should make it mandatory for doctors. So funny, you, funny yeah. you should say that because my teachers always said you're destined to be a doctor when you grow up. Because my <laughs> handwriting was, but Newton doesn't care. Newton just says, "I know what that is." <laughs> Okay, well, thanks very much, and thanks for all you're doing. Sure, thank you. <laughs> Daniel, are you waiting to talk? Go for it. Yes, yes, hi. Well, I have a question uh, about Einstein, about uh, what, what I have been doing in the past with Newton Script has always been modifying existing programs, adapting them to my needs or needs of the others and everything. So uh, I, my question is about adding color to the user interface of the of Einstein. I know Newton script in the in the beginning it was thought to add color and everything. So you have at the moment you have gray scales and everything in the in the values of the view format. Is it how how difficult would it be to add color to the user interface in Einstein? I think adding these flashy things can help uh, you know to bring Newton OS to the to these times. Um, uh, I like, I like that it doesn't have color because it, it really restricts you and how you have to find solutions and it's uh, non-offensive when you have it and use it. The user interface is always this little bold because of the LCD screen and I like the character that it has. Um, internally, there were some, uh, attempts uh, to get color going in the ROM. We can find traces of that, but the ROM itself does not have color support. It would be possible we have a system uh, that works very well where we can patch the ROM, so we can just uh, take code uh, that's in the ROM and override it with whatever we want to do in Einstein. And it would be possible, for example, um, the code that copies um, uh, picture data, image data, to make that support color. That would be a bit of a hack, but you could at least uh, get colored images onto the screen. I think that's about uh, the, the maximum that we could be doing. Otherwise, we would be rewriting the ROM, and since we're getting the source code soon, <laughs> um, uh, we can do that and then integrate color but we should limit it to green and white. <laughs> Good. Ronnie, did you have a question? Yeah, my question is that um, um, I remember a few years ago, Paul wrote a, um, an interface to translate soups into XML. And today, if you're going to try something like that, it would probably be something like JSON 5. 
which would then allow you then to interoperate information between the Einstein other platforms. Has any work been done in that sort of area at all? Because it's because I always thought the Newton was was um, out of the box, uh, a standalone device, and 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 to feed it information was was quite tricky. And today we're even more uh, less of a standalone device. Okay, or is the vision um, that it should be the original idea as a personal div uh, digital assistant and nothing more, and therefore. No, you, you solve those sorts of interoperability questions with something else. What's what's your um, um, position on this? Um, we do have access to all the data structures and we understand them. Um, and it probably would be possible to write JSON files right out of a live Newton via Einstein or use uh, backup files and extract uh, databases soups from it and store them in whatever format um, just storing them in the format though doesn't make the uh, interoperability um, what we need is really a synchronization then and and since everything's online these days uh, uh, just for example think about your address book uh, on most devices that's online and and all your devices just sync with the online version there really mm -hmm. isn't a, a, a physical database that we can sync with so the question would be does it make sense to teach Einstein to access uh, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, address book servers and and make the data so that uh, Newton OS can understand it. That would be my approach. But writing to JSON or XML or whatever format is absolutely possible. We just need the other side of the software then too. Okay, thanks. I just want to quickly point out that there is a community kind of launch pad for the, for the Newton community and that is newtontalk.net. Uh, it's an old-fashioned mailing list, and uh, if you want to, if you head over there, then you can, it's a good place to just kind of get connected with people. Uh, not everybody is on there, but uh, it's a good start. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> you should also mention, um, Paul, that uh, if you are on that uh, email, then there's a map application that goes with it. Is it not? Yes, Powell. Powell, you put together the worldwide Newton map. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't have a chance to update before the event, but um, I will do this uh, eventually <laughs> after the event because too many things at once and some technical difficulties. But uh, yes, we gonna put on. I'm gonna put on that website uh, all um, essential links. Uh, related with our community so that will be uh, I think that will be a really good uh, point to start um, for everybody who came today but they want to start and they don't know uh, for example about Newton talk or uh, other great uh, places when we when we can uh, have a um, when we can be connected. So I'm gonna put a few uh, interesting links there. So if you have a, a kind of suggestion for me about that, please send me uh, that link on email, please. Not here, not on the group chat because group chat is very busy. It's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to um, read everything at once. Um, but please send me uh, your suggestion what should be uh, on that website i'm gonna i'm gonna put it there and also uh, mm, i will put if uh, all presenters don't mind i'm gonna put uh, the all presentation if you deliver to me your presentation your uh, slideshows as a pdf i'm gonna put a link and upload that file so um, people uh, can uh, have access to this and also we're recording that session so uh, we will Mm, I will also include the links to that uh, videos when I'm uh, prepare them after the event a few days later, probably will show up on the website. So everybody will have access to that. So uh, I think that's all from my side. Jason, did you have a quick question? 
Yeah, I have one quick question. Well, maybe, I don't know if it's quick. <laughs> um, hi, Matthias. Um, I was wondering what your vision would be for Newton scripts specifically once we're free of the ROM dependency. Um, the, the, the current, I think Newton script is a, is a, is a fun language. I don't know if it, uh, in, uh, today where we have uh, JavaScript, which is very similar, uh, if it makes sense to, to develop on with that, but, uh, it's, it's a fun language. It's cool. And, uh, with new zero in the 64 bit version, it runs on, it still runs on every platform and it would, uh, now support larger data structures than were possible on, on uh, uh, Newton OS. So mm, I think it's a usable language. It does, of course, not have enough infrastructure to uh, become a mainstream or a language that other people will use, but uh, it would be still, I think, very interesting to keep the old software running and uh, interpret it and uh, working and make the package format work in 64 bit and some other stuff. So yeah, for some specific kind of applications, I think it's definitely still a valid language and uh, it's fully, uh, it integrates very much with the soup system. And the soup system is, is also a very easy way of uh, writing a database. So it has uh, definitely has its benefits.